This is Outbreak News This Week, brought to you by the Global Dispatch Incorporated. Outbreak News This Week is your source for all the news about worms and germs. And now, your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com. Here's Robert Harriman. Well, hey, Tampa Bay, and welcome to your source for all the news about worms and germs. My name is Robert, and I appreciate you listening today. And today we're going to take a hard look at one of the bigger public health crises in the world, and that's the healthcare crisis in Venezuela. And Venezuela's tumbling economy and the authoritarian rule has precipitated uh, really an unprecedented humanitarian crisis. Uh, the country's now experiencing somewhere in the ballpark of a 1 million percent inflation. Uh, the healthcare is in a crisis situation. There's an exodus of uh, scientists and healthcare professionals leaving the country. Um, hundreds of thousands of children are, are at risk for death from malnutrition. Uh, and according to the uh, latest official nationwide epidemiologic bulletin, from 2016, infant and maternal mortality has risen up to 65%. Um, there is also the reemergence of arthropod-borne and vaccine-preventable diseases in Venezuela. So I'm really honored to have my guest on today. Joining me to discuss the epidemic situation in Venezuela is Dr. Alberto Paniz Mondolfi. Dr. Paniz Mondolfi is an infectious disease pathologist a clinician at the IDB Biomedical Research Institute in Barquisimato, Venezuela. I hope I said that right. He is also yes. the founder of the Venezuelan Science Incubator. This is an independent health research organization, and he's a member of the Venezuelan Academy of Medicine. Dr. Paniz Mandolfi, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for hosting me. Okay. Tonight. I appreciate it very much, and it's and it'll be great to get this bird's eye view of what's uh, going on down there uh, concerning these epidemics. And like I said, you're right there in the heart of Venezuela. Um, doctor, can you give us a good summary of not just the infectious disease situation, but the overall health situation today in Venezuela? Yes, well, um, we should start mentioning Venezuela as basically a failed state. Um, which is experiencing its worst economic and humanitarian crisis, probably the largest humanitarian crisis ever witnessed in the hemisphere. Um, all the basis of this crisis is the economic collapse of the country, which is the result of nearly two decades of erratic political and economic policies, which basically date back from the installment of the Bolivarian Revolution um, since then, the government has improvised short-term plans, completely deployed of long-term investments, and basically this has played a very bad toll. Um, uh, the government continues to um, impose its, its pressures and radicalize, and this alongside a drop in oil prices, and we must highlight here that oil is all of what Venezuela economy is about, um, in addition to nationalization of private manufacturing industry, um, a, a very wicked currency exchange control um, and policies basically have allowed the situation to wreak havoc. Um, Venezuelans today are struggling to survive in a country with an escalating violence. Uh, with the world's, as you already mentioned, highest annual inflation rate. Um, for 2018, the estimates were that inflation would reach a million percent, but it basically went over it to 1,370,000%. Uh, yeah. And it's projected to close around 10 million percent by 2019, um, with a minimum salary of two bucks a month. So this is this this landscape. This basically you you can pretty much draw the landscape on how Venezuelan livelihoods have been degraded to an extent that drug scarcity and, as you already mentioned, malnutrition indicators um, basically uh, draw a picture of a country in war. 
the health system has collapsed um, with the failing, not only the failing infrastructure, but also shortages in, in medical supplies. Um, a, a drama that we we have down here is that you know uh, the data on the humanitarian situation is largely unavailable and can only be accessed by local organizations, um, NGOs like Caritas Venezuela, who reports on data for food and health and nutrition, right? And um, another of the of the most worrisome uh, aspects of the healthcare system is that only up to thirty eight percent of essential drugs included in the WHO list um, are currently available if you find them. And 30% of basic uh, drugs to treat infectious disease are only available in public hospitals. Um, so as for Human Rights Watch um, uh, latest report, 88% of the hospitals in Venezuela actually lack basic medicines. Um, yes, of course, as you mentioned, malnutrition uh, is a consequence of a crisis that has also led to critical shortages of food. Um, and, and the numbers are quite alarming. Uh, Caritas Venezuela warns that up to 280,000 children could actually die of malnutrition. And Human Rights Watch has reported a raise in infant mortality up to 30% in 2016, um, reporting that 8 out of 10 households are food insecure. And then you have to add the refugee crisis. Mm -hmm. So all this big landscape um, has derived in a social collapse, which has prompted millions of Venezuela to leave their crippled home country. And this has generated to what to date is considered the most massive exodus in Latin American history. Um, this can only be compared um, to the flow of refugees in Syria, uh, Syrians into the Western Europe in 2015. We are talking here, Robert, of, two, of over three to four million Venezuelan nationals um, which have left the country since 2014. Um, and, 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 and most the, the most conservative numbers point out to 2.5 million. Uh, uh, of these, close to a million Venezuelans reside now in Colombia. Uh, up to 40,000 Venezuelans have entered Brazil as per numbers of the, of the UN Refugee Agency. Uh, close to 93,000 in Ecuador and close to 400,000 of, of, of these migrants are actually food insecure in these host countries. So I think this pretty much draws the, the, the picture of the humanitarian crisis in our country. Yeah, yeah, such a tragedy because I'm old enough to remember when Venezuela was like the beacon of Latin America, you know? Absolutely, the most oil rich country on earth. We're sitting right on top the largest reservoirs of oil known uh, in the world. So, you know, it's, 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 it's what is known in the oil world as, in the oil world as the paradox of plenty. And this is what actually happened to Venezuela. Yeah. Okay, well, let's uh, go ahead and switch gears to the epidemic situations down there. Uh, that's pretty much what the, the theme of this uh, radio show is about. And um, let's start with the measles situation. Um, it was just... I don't know, a decade ago that the circulation of wild measles was interrupted in Venezuela, you know, they has, thanks to some very good mass vaccination campaigns. Uh, doctor, can you talk about um, that and the reemergence of measles in Venezuela? Sure. Yes. Um, in Venezuela, as you mentioned, circulation of wild measles was interrupted um, in February 2007. This after a mass vaccination campaign that followed the 2001 and 2006 outbreaks. Since Feb 2007, um, measles transmission was actually interrupted and we haven't had a measles uh, um, case reported to date. Um, today, I mean, however, uh, 2017, was when measles reemerged in Venezuela. And this happened particularly within uh, vulnerable indigenous populations down south in the Guayana Shield and the Amazon Basin. And it basically had its origins due to, due to a massive migration of 
people who had lost their jobs and um, that coincided with the drop in oil prices and the government installing the what is known as the Orinoco mining arc. Um, this is basically a, a melting pot of illegal mining and guerrilla and violence and anarchy and the extraction of gold. So this actually brought infected migrants from Brazil and from other parts of the world. And basically that was the hotspot that originated the measles crisis. So um, from, from the mining camps in Bolivar is where measles started, started spreading throughout the country. As for October 2018, Venezuela had contributed with 68% of the measles cases reported in the Americas and um, also most of the measles related deaths. And today it affects um, basically all states in the country. So um, besides illegal mining, the circulation of measles in Venezuela, we can say was also preceded by a progressive interruption of the national immunization program, which um, happened pretty much since 2010. And also, along with the dismantling of the primary health care infrastructure. Um, so if we closely examine the numbers, we know that the national coverage rates for the second dose of the measles vaccine was estimated in 52%. And those were as per the last reports from the Venezuelan Ministry of Health, uh, which are official reports, which are largely unavailable, not to say unavailable. Mm -hmm. So 52%, an official number, and this estimate ranks Venezuela toward the bottom of the vaccination coverage in the region. And this is much worse as you go to isolated rural areas like the indigenous populations. For example, the Amazon, which is being hit tremendously with illegal mining activity, current estimates of measles vaccination coverage in the Amazon region have basically decreased throughout all municipalities. Um, where the gold mining activity is located, basically, is where the lowest coverage um, um, is achieved. So this is notably affecting the Venezuela-Brazilian uh, border, where actually current measles outbreak is, is, is sadly threatening to decimate the ancestral Aboriginal Yanomami people who inhabit the highlands of the highlands of Parima in the Amazon state. So, with with uh, measles spilling over, particularly in Brazil, I, I, we at the website we keep a really close eye on what's going on down there, and uh, Brazil has seen uh, thousands of cases, all from Venezuela, basically. Um, what what is Brazil? Uh, what do they have to say about this? Absolutely, absolutely. We closely, we, uh, we'll talk about this later, but uh, we closely work with collaborators in the Fio Cruz, in, in, in Instituto Valdo Cruz in Manaus, and we closely follow up on, on these numbers. And as you mentioned, absolutely, emigration from Venezuela has substantially affecting, affected Brazil, but not only Brazil. Colombia and other countries in the region, such as Ecuador and, and Peru. So um, measles cases imported from Venezuela have been reported throughout the Andean region. And this is basically because of cross-border mobility, migration, and in down south, uh, what pertains specifically to Brazil, is the illegal mining activities that have been the main sources of disease spread in the south. Um, and you're right, thus far, Brazil has reported most of the important measles cases, mainly from the state of Bolivar, where the, where, where the Orinoco mining arc is, 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 is actually ongoing, and where the major measles outbreak is taking place um, since, since its initial emergence. And um, we are close to almost 4,000 cases in, in, in all neighboring states of Brazil meaning Roraima and Amazonas, um, with, with approximately up to 7,000 cases under investigation. Uh, of the totality of the cases reported by Brazil's Ministry of Health uh, in the state of Roraima, just 
for a number um, through May 2018, 68% of the measles cases actually um, were reported from refugees from Venezuela. And what is most interesting is that of the 68%, 52.7% were, uh, were patients from an Amerindian tribe called the Waraos. And the Waraos are Amerindian that inhabit the Orinoco Delta, which is, uh, you know, quite distant from Bolivar. What is happening is that the humanitarian crisis has hit so hard in the Orinoco Delta that the Waraos are migrating down south to the mines and then to Brazil. So, so it's, it's, it's become a, 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 a cultural crisis as well for our Amerindian tribes in Venezuela. Um, the Colombian Ministry of Health has also reported close to 30 imported cases, me, uh, measles cases from Venezuela and Ecuador as well. Um, we got to take into consideration that the Rumichaca International Bridge, which actually connects um, uh, Colombia and Ecuador, uh, uh, basically has seen 286,000 uh, uh, persons which have crossed um, that bridge. So up to now, they, there have been close to 700 suspected cases in Ecuador, with close to thir uh, somewhere around 15, 20 confirmed cases. Also, per the, the Peruvian Ministry of Health has, has reported imported cases from Venezuela. Last number I was managing was two, that probably um, is, is a higher number right now. So, um, Dr. Paniz Mondolfi, if... If I, if you were d down there and have a child today in Venezuela, even if you had the money, c can you get the children vaccinated? I mean, is there an availability of it? Um, this is erratic um, because uh, the public health system is basically in decay. So, um, you know, months before the measles and diphtheria kicked in, uh, it was basically impossible to access vaccination in the public health system. You could, with luck, access the vaccines in the private health system. However, these vaccines were sold at international prices. With a country that is undergoing a currency exchange control and in which you only had access to dollars in the black market. So we are talking on the hundredfold uh, value of what the supposed legal exchange rate is in the market. So basically, uh, the bottom line here is that for most Venezuelans, including a doctor like me, paying for your child's vaccinations in dollars was basically impossible. So, 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 yeah, and and and, and to complement this, Robert, again, uh, it, it's not only vaccines. It's long. It, it, it's been long. We we've confronted long-term shortages of essential medicines, medical supplies, and of course, this this impacted very much the market in biologicals like vaccines. Um, and 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 you have to add. Not only not only the access to vaccines, but the crumbling healthcare infrastructure, which basically led over the last years to an interruption and weakening of the national immunization programs. Well, let's uh, go ahead. You, you kind of touched on this already, but there's another vaccine preventable disease that's really reemerged in I don't know what's been about 25 years, and that's um, that's diphtheria, um, and this is. Uh, a, a disease with a much higher case fatality rate than measles. Um, doctor, can you discuss the diphtheria situation in Venezuela? Yes, so indeed, um, as you mentioned, diphtheria had not been reported in Venezuela in the past 24 years. Before 2016, when, when the first cases were reported. So that occurred between July and November 2016, in which a total of close to 200 suspected diphtheria cases were reported. And it was massive because it, it, cases were reported in 60 out, out of 24 states in Venezuela. And since then, close to um, 3,000 cases have been reported to date. 
Um, you know, we we must highlight here that Venezuela ranked fourth on diphtheria cases worldwide in 2017 after Nigeria, India, and Indonesia. So that is the situation. Um, of these, you know, close to, by 2017, close to 2,200 cases, almost 1,200 were laboratory confirmed. And um, uh, close to 300 reported deaths yielding a case fatality rate of, of almost around 22%. Wow. Um, yeah, so we actually, and, and these are largely underestimates of what the situation was. Because we, we, in this year, we actually, in 2017, 2018, we followed closely on outbreaks in the South. And these were cases that were not reported, and um, and and thus they were not in the national. Um, so even if you report, the the government is not going to record the cases, and um, we don't know what is actually being recorded to to the Pan American Health Organization. Um, for 2018, um, there was a total of of, of 840 diphtheria cases. Um, uh, that had been reported today in the Americas, and 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 all, only three countries, Haiti, Brazil, and Colombia, um, had had made up the totality of these cases. In Colombia, for example, uh, the reported cases, um, three out of eight cases in Colombia were actually imported cases from Venezuela. Uh, so you know, like just like in as in the case of measles. It was low local vaccination coverage rates that basically left the Venezuelan population susceptible to the resurgence of this disease. Um, let's put it in numbers. So by 2016, the national coverage with three doses of DTP, the diphtheria tetanus pertussis vaccine, approached 84%. And the reported coverage for four doses barely reached 60%. Um, so, so PAHO estimated the coverage rates in 2017 uh, for 66% in DTP3 and 38 for four doses. The recent unofficial data that has been collected suggests that for 2018, the national DTP3 coverage might not even reach 50%. Wow. And, and, and of course, this, this is resulting in an important increase in the number of susceptible persons, of whom close to 3 million children all are vulnerable. So, um, so, so this, is, this is nationwide. Now, achieving vaccination rates is even more difficult in the hotspots, remote areas, like, for example, in the South, um, one, because of geographic isolation, uh, and then because illegal mining has attracted and, and, and provoked an ongoing conflict between armed gangs and Colombia guerrilla forces and military personnel, and that hampers the access to rural community. So in southern areas like in the Amazon basis, basin and in, in Bolivar State um, and Amazonas and in the Delta, these are at particularly at risk because there's a low pentavalent um, vaccination, DTP, hemophilus, um, and, and hepatitis vaccination. It, the, the reported coverage have been of 50, 37, 24%, according to the Ministry of Health. So um, the problem has, you know, I, I think the worst is to come even though uh, PAHO is aware of the situation and some massive immunization campaigns have been erratically implemented in Venezuela right now. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Penis, um, Mondolfi, I'm we're getting up on the hard break. Um, I hope you uh, stick around for uh, the second half. I appreciate that. Sure. Of course. And I uh, just want to thank the audience for listening. And I appreciate uh, Dr. Penis, Mondolfi uh, calling in uh, from Venezuela. He's right in the heart of it. And uh, again, I wanted you to check out the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com, OutbreakNewsToday.com, and the podcast. You can find that at Outbreak News Interviews, which is on Apple Podcast, Stitcher Radio, and Spotify. And we also just recently started, I did the first episode of 
Outbreak News TV on YouTube, and my guest for that was uh, Dr. Michael Osterholm. So I encourage you to check that out. It's really good stuff. So after the break, more on the crisis in Venezuela with Dr. Panez Mandolfi. Welcome back to Outbreak News This Week, your source for all the news about worms and germs. Here's your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Welcome back to the program. Well, uh, in the first half of the show, we've been uh, looking at Venezuela and uh, the different infectious disease epidemic situations that are going on there, and, and, and there are many, right? And I've been talking to uh, Dr. Alberto Paniz Mandolfi. He's down there in Venezuela right now, and he's uh, been gracious enough to join us today to discuss uh, the epidemic situation down there. Um, and uh, we're going to continue to talk about vaccine preventable diseases. And right, we've already talked about measles and, and diphtheria. Um, and you, you would think other vaccine preventable diseases would be on the rise also. Uh, is this something that we're seeing, but they're just yeah. not being reported? Absolutely. Absolutely. We've seen an increase in varicella cases throughout the Great Savannah region and the Guyana Shield. And actually, reports from colleagues nationwide um, also point on a resurgence of varicella cases. Um, <clears throat> now, what, what, what worries us the most is, is actually the, the possible resurgence of polio. Exactly. Um, yeah, since the Americas has not seen a case of all polio in the last 25 years, right? Um, I think last case dating back in 1991 in Peru, as reported by, by PAHO. And, and let me tell you, we had a close experience. We had a close experience with this because in June 2018, the, the WHO received an unofficial report on the occurrence of what apparently was a Sabine type 3 vaccine associated paralytic polymyelitis in, mm -hmm. in a Venezuelan patient. Yes, this was actually later confirmed by the IHR National Focal Point in Venezuela. And this, as I mentioned earlier, was a case reported in a male infant who belonged to the Warao Amerindian tribe. So this was in the Orinoco Delta. And apparently a second case was later uh, reported as well um, in the National Institute of Hygiene, and apparently an eight-year-old girl from the same community. However, this was never confirmed again. Uh, fortunately, uh, although this was managed on a very obscure way and there was basically no access to information, finally, unfortunately, the Global Polio Eradication Initiative issued an official report notifying that, you know, final lab testing had confirmed that the cause of paralysis in this child was not actually neither wild polio nor vaccine-derived poliovirus. What it was... Um, it remains to be seen. We don't know, but this this story, you know, basically raises a red flag on what can be a potential scenario on other vaccine preventable diseases as deadly as polio. Well, it's and it's not just the vaccine preventable diseases in Venezuela, but uh, I think the first the first outbreak I started paying attention to a lot was malaria. So we're talking about vector borne diseases are also on the rise. Um, the number of malaria cases has risen dr dramatically in recent years. Um, doctor, what, what can you tell us about the malaria situation in Venezuela? So, um, yes, uh, it's not only the reemergence of vaccine prevent preventable diseases. It's also vector borne diseases like malaria, as you point out. And then we can later talk about Chagas disease and leishmaniasis, which you also have to keep an eye on. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think, you know, Robert, the case of malaria is probably the saddest story of Venezuela's sanitary and healthcare system collapse. Venezuela was once recognized as the world pioneer in malaria eradication thanks to the efforts of, of Venezuelan physician, John Hopkins graduate, Dr. Arnoldo Gabaldon, who successfully carried out a malaria control campaign in Venezuela 
um, which was implemented with the interruption of malaria transmission by systematic and integrative infection and vector control. And you know, actually in 1971, the malaria-free regions in Venezuela had increased close to 80%. So, so this is a sad story um, for a country that was, pion was a pioneer in malaria eradication policies. Um, today, however, malaria epidemic in Venezuela, as you mentioned, is now approaching half a million cases per year and continues to increase at rates exceeding those previously reported anywhere in the world. What is more is that endemic malaria transmission is now beginning to propagate across the whole country, including urban and periurban foci. And this along combined with an increase in the hotspot, which actually persists and continue to disseminate the cases in the Guayana region. Um, and, and this is striking. This is really striking given that Latin America had made an, a substantial advance towards elimination uh, with a regional reduction of disease up to 62% throughout 2000-2015. Um, however, there, is a, there, there, there was a considerable increase of up to 875,000 cases that was observed in 2016, and with Venezuela contributing close to 35% of these cases. So malaria is not only becoming a problem to Venezuela, it is becoming a problem for our neighbors. This poses a huge risk to our neighbors. Um, data that we have is that um, throughout 2016, 2018, uh, there was a total of 258,000 or so malaria cases reported in Colombia. Um, and uh, from, from a total of 3,395 uh, 3, cases imported from other countries, um, uh, 3,124 3, cases were imported primarily from Venezuela. Um, that means that Venezuela actually contributed, contributed with 92% of the imported malaria cases to Colombia. And it's not only Colombia, it's other South American countries that have also felt the impact of mass migration from Venezuela and the spread of important malaria throughout the region. This is important because um, this is basically the case of current cross-border outbreaks that are taking place at the Ecuadorian and Peruvian border. Um, similar to our observations, uh, most of the cases, up to 96%, recorded to date in the Pacific Ocean coastal region um, have actually followed the influx of infected Venezuelan migrants. For example, countries like Ecuador, with an effective nationwide elimination program in place, the arrival of malaria-infected refugees is, is posing a very strong risk of, of malaria reemergence, um, with imported cases exhibiting a capacity to trigger, again, autochthonous malaria transmissions in disease-free areas. And this has been reported previously. Um, as for other countries, other malaria endemic countries, Venezuela, um, other malaria endemic countries such as Brazil and Colombia, the burden of important cases from Venezuela may also influence a shift in malaria endemicity. So we are basically putting our neighbors at risk. Now, like with measles, um, did malaria also kind of get its start in the mining areas? Yes, so that that was basically that was basically the start, and it coincided with the illegal mining activity, which um, basically increased uh, with the massive migrations, with with the uh, with the informal job, uh, and people migrating down south. So so basically, uh, most of the malaria. Uh, uh, cases can be tackled down to the illegal mining activity in, in southern state of Bolivar. Okay. Um, and, and you know what, Robert? Yes. Let me tell you, since, since I brought Dr. Gabaldon uh, it, 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 when we started talking about, about malaria, actually, you, 
you know, there, malaria-free regions in Venezuela did not see malaria cases since the 70s. And, and Dr. Gabaldon actually said, you know, he wrote once that malaria eradication uh, could be attained in the, new, in the near future, but it was going to be impossible to contain in two scenarios. Out-of-door transmission, one scenario, and those areas that were inhabited by nomadic um, people, like the Indian tribes that I've been mentioning throughout our conversation in the Amazon and Bolivar State. Um, can we go ahead and let's, I guess the same question, how about the arboviruses? Um, are we seeing a resur- uh, um, not a resurgence, but an increase in dengue and chikungunya and the like? Well, yes, arboviruses continue to be an expanding threat in today's Venezuela. Um, Dengue continues to be a major public health problem in the country, with all four serotypes co-circulating in Venezuela. And Venezuela is actually witnessing an upswing in incidence, frequency, and magnitude of dengue epidemics uh, against a background of perennial endemic transmission. So, um, to put it in numbers, incidence in the population has actually risen from an average of 39.5 cases per 100,000 people in the early 90s to a ninefold higher mean incidence of 368 cases per 100,000 people throughout 2010 2016. Why is this happening? Well, because there's failed basic services like portable water, along with a combination of other poverty related socioeconomic factors, increasingly crowded living condition, growing population density, density precarious homes, and um, again, as I mentioned, longstanding deficits in public services, basically water. So there's been prolonged interruptions on water supply and electricity throughout Venezuela in the last years. And um, all these factors have been linked with a greater risk of acquiring dengue virus infection and favoring breeding sites for the vectors. Um, Similarly, Venezuela was not spared from the havoc wrought of the epidemic of chikungunya in 2014, um, as so by the Zika epidemic, which occurred a year later. Mm -hmm. Actually, the effect of both epidemics was actually amplified, and this, this is very important, uh, the, the major factor playing in both epidemic was the lack of timely official information, um, which basically led to a lack of preparedness and alongside worsening economic and health crisis, uh, uh, there was also um, acute shortages of diagnostics and, and, and basic medicines and medical supplies. And throughout the epidemic, there was, you know, an overburdened health system. Uh, for example, the attack rate of chikungunya was estimated to be between 6.9 percent, 13.8 percent, with the 57 uh, with the uh, observed attack rate in populated urban urban areas reach 40, 50 percent. Um, that's similar or higher to what's reported. What was reported in other countries. Um, Tahoe, for example, the total number of, of chikungunya cases in 2014 for the Epi Week 51 was close to 35,000 cases with an incidence of 121.5 per 1,000 individuals. Um, but again, there was a paucity of official information, and um, if you if you if you bring on board and take in consideration the estimates based on excess fever cases, which were not explained by other causes, um, uh, cases of chikungunya actually exceeded two million. So it resulted in an incidence of six thousand nine hundred and seventy five cases per one thousand population. That was 12 times higher than the reported official rate of the Venezuelan Ministry of Health. Um, And this was basically because of underreport. And again, a similar scenario was observed for Zika. You know, the number of symptomatic cases during the peak of the epidemic was estimated to be an incidence around 2,000 cases per 100,000 population. Uh, Again, being this a large underestimate of the real situation. Um, 
But you know, most importantly, uh, aside from from what from the syndemics of of of, of Sika and Chikungunya, which happened basically close one to another and then overlapped, was that the Sika virus epidemic um, revealed the presence of other circulating arbos. Um, with epidemic potential. So actually, we learned that Mayaro was circulating Oropuche and um, cryptic transmission cycles of episodic strains of Venezuelan equine encephalitis, um, Madariaga virus. Right. So, so the major challenge um, here, um, you know, was, was underreporting and the lack of public health infrastructure available for diagnosis and treatment. Um, we basically, our group basically um, outsourced most of the diagnostics abroad. So did other groups in, 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 in Valencia, one of the largest cities in Venezuela as well. And that's how we really managed to, to have a, a, a close landscape of what was happening with Arbos down here. Yeah, and now... Um... Yeah, yeah, and here us, us here in the states are definitely keeping a close eye on some of these other uh, uh, arboviruses like myaro because something's going to be the next one, right? Um, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, one arbovirus I would like to talk about is your your neighbors, uh, Brazil. Uh, they do have some endemic yellow fever. Um, any big concern about that? Not to date, you know, I think the yellow fever campaign was actually very robust in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. um, we do continue to have yellow fever cases. Um, we have a steady number of yellow, of yellow fever cases, the jungle related yellow fever, and we have had some peri-urban yellow fever cases as well. Um, again, we do not have official numbers, okay? And, and this diagnostics is, 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 we basically do not have access because most of these cases are sent, um, for confirmation in the National Institute of Hygiene. And you can imagine the scenario that, you know, if you have, for example, malaria related deaths and you have to, um, sign a death certificate, you have to sign that with the National Guard standing right next to you. Hmm. And it's absolutely prohibited to list malaria as a cause of death in a death certificate. Hmm. So you can imagine if you have any attempt of signing a death, cert a death certificate with yellow fever, um, that will probably take you right straight to jail. So unfortunately, yellow fever is one of those um, viruses that we have to keep an eye closed and that unfortunately we do not have much information on. Um, also, you know, mimickers like um, uh, <clears throat> uh, Wales disease, for example, Leptospira, um, we are having a lock, uh, a, a, a huge lack of access to diagnosis. So even mimickers of yellow fevers are being are being difficult to diagnose, and and I think that's that's going to pose a big problem, especially in the in the, in the classic yellow fever endemic areas. Now, you mentioned a little bit earlier in the interview about uh, uh, Chagas and Leishmaniasis. Um, can you give us a short uh, summary on what uh, that situation is? Well, you know, wake up call. Um, uh, even though both diseases are endemic in Venezuela, there has been a persistent endemism, especially of Chagas disease. And Venezuela has witnessed a number of outbreaks of oral Chagas disease. Um, more recently, there was, in, in, in the refugee crisis, there was a family that migrated to Colombia. And these cases were recorded in the Colombian Institute of Health. And they were patients that uh, had turned out to uh, be diagnosed with acute Chagas disease, and they were Venezuelan migrants, um, they were refugees, and they had recently, a week before, migrated from Venezuela, and the source was actually traced to the state of Táchira, a uh, Venezuelan neighboring state to Colombia, 
and where it was actually um, uh, confirmed that they had acquired oral Chagas disease from a contaminated um, Jews. Yeah. So, so the risk of of importing of of, of exporting um, Chagas disease and leishmania um, is 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 on is on the table, and and we should actually follow closely um, these these um, trypanosomiasis because. Um, they're silent, uh, and they can give us surprises. Well, I, I got about four minutes left. Uh, time flies when you're having fun. And, uh, <laughs> and I really appreciate this interview. Um, but I want to make sure I give you a few minutes to talk about the Venezuelan Science Incubator. This is actually how I found you on Twitter and uh, the work that's being done there. So the, that's, that's interesting. Um, the Venezuelan Science Incubator was a group that was born uh, basically in the crisis hit Venezuela with a massive exodus of physicians. And um, there was a whole country that was expecting to be taken care of. And basically medical students uh, had to assume their early role as doctors and researchers to stand and um, start working for their people. So the Venezuelan Science Incubator was born in the midst of the crisis and was basically brewed um, by, by, by a, well, a, a view of, of some uh, trending, innovative concepts like citizen science. So let me give you a preview. You know, uh, Venezuelans have endured a decade of political and social economic upheaval. Um, and, and, and even with restricted resources, there are many possible approaches to tackle the crisis. So when state infrastructure does not work, um, surveillance can be achieved via mobilization of citizen scientists or informal networks of healthcare professionals. And that was what was the incubator was all about. Um, it was a group of uh, MDs and a group of students that um, needed to respond to the crisis and had a very, very strong uh, um, uh, research-based uh, um, uh, thought. So, so that's how we created the incubator, and um, it's it. The incubator has been a surprising experience because we've been even able to perform basic um, science research uh, despite the scars um, availability of reagents and lab facilities. So, so I think Venezuela has to be proud of these kids. You know, I was just, I'm just the mentor uh, and I'm on my way out, but these kids have done a wonderful job on, on trying to keep science alive and translational medicine because all what has been done in the incubator has been delivered to suffering communities um, as part of this humanitarian crisis. Okay, I got about one minute, but I want, I want to ask you this question. Um, if you look into the future, uh, where do you see Venezuela in a year, two years or more from now? I think um, Venezuela, Venezuela has a bright future. Um, I, think, I think we're close to the end. Um, I always, I always bring this, you know, the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela is unsustainable. Um, you know, it is critical that international organizations begin a full-scale response to help our people overcome this devastating humanitarian crisis. And there is no way this can continue. I am absolutely confident that we Venezuelans will come out of this devastating situation soon. The global community has now recognized the magnitude of the crisis and help is on the way. For those of us who still remain in the country, we are ready, believe me, we are ready to undertake on the, ta on the challenge of reconstruction. And as I mentioned, there is a bright future ahead of us. No doubt about that. Okay, well, it was really great talking to you. And um, uh, for listeners, I will put a link to the Venezuelan Science Incubator um, 
on the website when I publish the podcast to this radio show. And if you want to read more about these epidemics, uh, you can look at the ahead of print version of in the journal Emerging Infectious Diseases, which I will also link to. And I want to thank you, Dr. Alberto Paniz Mondolfi, for your time, expertise, and sharing this story about Venezuela and the region for us. No, thank you, Dr. Harriman. Uh, not only me, but on behalf of the Venezuelan people, we can't thank you enough for this opportunity on allowing us to raise awareness of what's happening down here in our country. Perfect. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you for listening to Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman. If you missed any part of today's program, you can listen to the podcast anytime on our website, outbreaknewstoday.com. Make sure to join us here next week for Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman.